I said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was like? I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded women's lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He says, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before women's lib. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. It breaks up the family. School is an 18-year forced government training program that sterilizes the potential for brilliance in children, those who actually survive schooling and survive conformity and continue on to think for themselves, truly are a rare breed. All children start out as curious, highly experimental minds, and then one day, they're sent to school. Mandatory schooling has never consisted of anything but the memorization of monotonous dead facts and training children to master repetitious behavior. For the greater part of their day, everything the child says must match the interest of their school teachers. Their behavior must coincide with a set policy and a set regulation. They cannot use the bathrooms without permission. If they wish to speak, they must raise their hands. And after every hour or so, a bell rings and everyone must move to it. It couldn't be any more slave-like. And this type of training becomes a ritual for the child. It becomes the plot background for their television shows and books or the ideology taught to them by a teacher or a parent. An entire monoculture is being developed here, stripping children of their power to cause trouble for the state at an early age, training them to be good servants of the politically correct. Their environment is much like a prison by the population lacking any ability to check the authority of the warden. My name is Ryan Anacog, former Marine Corporal. Before I start today, I'd like to, to say that I'm sharing my story because I'm a patriotic American, and I love my country, and I would do anything to protect it. I deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom on March 1st, 2005. I'd been in the Marine Corps for just over a year. I was a 21-year-old boy fulfilling my duty to my country. The vast majority of the Marines in my platoon Marines that had already fought in Fallujah, and a lot of them had been in Baghdad as well. To me, these Marines, they were heroes. They, they, they were my heroes. They were American heroes. From the moment I landed on the deck in Ramadi, I was so filled with hate and discontent from the very people that we were there to help that I was 100% blinded and 100% numbed to reality. I stood post one day with a fellow new Marine decided in on a man walking down the street, alone, unarmed, and I said, I'm not leaving this country without killing anybody. It's not happening. My seniors have taught me well. If you think, if you think anything is fishy, pull the trigger, period. The radio report you saw two or three guys with weapons, you immediately engaged, killing one of them, and the other one or two ran off with weapons. It's as simple as that. No one gets in trouble. My fellow Marine laughed immediately, pushed me to shoot, pressuring me, telling me just shoot him, just shoot him. Luckily for that man, I guess for myself, he was out of sight by the time I looked back and got my eye back in the sights. Because I'm not sure what I would have done had he still been there when I turned around. We knew every way to walk right around the line of engagement, the rules of engagement. What a joke. To us runs rules of engagement were not rules at all, but merely words on a piece of paper somewhere printed for the sole purpose of protecting officers if we grunts actually got caught. Try to imagine yourself tonight as you sleep warm in your bed with your wife, your children in the next room. 2 a.m., your door is kicked in and men are screaming. As they kick open your bedroom door, they're screaming in a language you don't understand. They're pointing machine guns at your face. As they drag you by your hair from your bed, slamming your face down onto the ground. Putting their boots on the back of your neck and smashing your face farther into the concrete floor. Your struggle to protect your family and your home is futile as you are blindfolded and handcuffed so tight you lose feeling in your hands within minutes. All you know is you can hear your screaming wife and children crying for help. And you are too useless to protect them. You are not on a 
a list of suspected terrorists. You are not on a list of known terrorists. In fact, you completely supported the U.S. coming into your country and promising freedom and prosperity. You were simply a man in a house on a street that my platoon decided to search. When your blindfold is finally released, the men have left your home, it's destroyed. Your wife and children are huddled in a corner defenseless and crying. Every drawer in your home is thrown, the contents broken, soiled. Your bed has been urinated on. Your wife's panties are glued to the wall. Maybe a family heirloom is missing or other job objects stolen. The floor is wet with fresh chewing tobacco spit you vainly try to tell your family it will be okay and never happen again, but in your heart you know all the while your chances are it probably will. As time continued to pass, my ego grew stronger and my hate boiled within my veins. A scene like this was nothing more than a Tuesday to me. I laughed as I heard a story one of the platoons had strapped dead bodies from a gunfight to the hoods of their Humvees and drove around the city for hours, blasting death metal music as they terrorized the population. Just another Tuesday to me. Back on post, there was a time when somehow, someway, an Iraqi had managed to get himself lost and ended up knocking on the door of my post, which happened to be next to our sleeping area. As I answered the door and saw the Iraqi standing there, I accepted my fate, and I jumped on top of him. I accepted he was a suicide bomber, and I had seen my last day as I began to punch him. Brutally, I sat on top of him, punching him as hard as I could. After a moment, I got him under control and handcuffed him. He was simply a man who had just gotten lost. I was punished harshly, not for my actions, not for parting and un armed civilian, but for not killing him. I was told he should have been killed for being there and I would have been protected. I was forced to burn human feces, stand hours of additional post, and physically punished. I was ostracized and called a wuss and a girl for not killing him. I had lost all the respect that I had gained and that I had killed for to earn. I was forced to stand six hours of post at a time, directly behind an air conditioning unit, with all the heat blasting out the backside onto my face, in the middle of the summer in one of the hottest places on the earth. I stood that post 12 hours a day, 40, four days a week, for over a month. The man that arose from that month was someone I hoped to never meet again. The last bit of humanity morality I had left was gone. I was given a media machine gun, an unlimited ammo, and just told to spend a couple of hours per post down at a post that was usually unmanned. It had extended view and less observers that could see what I was doing while I was down there. It was expressed to me that I was now a shooter. It was being placed down there to shoot. Don't worry, we have your back. Make sure your combat reports are rock solid and we'll take care of you. You saw two guys with weapons and one ran off. Rules of engagement may change like the tides of the ocean or winds of a hurricane. But people don't come back from the dead. Sometimes from one hour to the next, the rule of engagement would change. At 10 a.m., someone with a shovel on, the, on a certain street would be killed and at 10.30, he shouldn't be killed. You can change the rule, but you can't bring that person back to life. And when you can't bring him back to life, you tell me that I just murdered him. After returning home from the war, I began drinking, not caring. I had an attitude that ruled my life where I didn't care if I lived, if I died, where I went, or what I did. As the mental brainwashing and numbing that the Marine Corps given me, dissipated. The only way to substitute that numbing was through alcohol. I started to think back to the people I shot and the lives that I ruined through my hatred and violence. And sometimes it was just too much.
much for me to handle. This war has not only taken the lives of countless Iraqi men, women, and children, but it has destroyed how many? Who knows? Countless American lives have been destroyed. American veterans. People who join to serve their country and be American heroes. Many vets feel that there's just no one out there who can help them and end up on the street homeless with nothing, or sometimes worse. Veterans are attempting and completing suicide attempts at an unprecedented rate. That's for a reason. What's worse is to die for no reason, or to live a life of violence and destruction, internal structure and hatred every single day for no reason. To live every day knowing that everything that was instilled in me from the moment I was born as a free American boy, all the morals and everything that was taught to me, I gave away at the moment I pulled the trigger for acceptance. <laughs> the moment that I beat another human being half to death simply to feel like the heroes that I held with such regard. I know today that I cannot mend the things that I have broken or fix the lives that I have destroyed, but maybe with my testimony today, I can help one person and might help two people who eventually can help four and maybe all of us together, standing united, can prevent these atrocities. Never